Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Allison Kuo. I'm the Arts Residency Manager at the International Studio and Curatorial Program, where Anita has been a digital resident for several months now. And I'm recording this today from the ISCP offices in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Um, my name is Anita Fuchs and Yes, I had been on residency <laughs> in New York, <laughs> or not, um, and I will present some work. To give an overview over my work, um, I will start with some projects um, I did in the artist group Resanita. Um, Resanita, that is um, Resa Piantala and me, we worked for a couple of years. Uh, we worked for 10 years, nearly 10 years as artists. Um, and project observation journal. Um, this project deals with history and politics and but also with um, current um, topics like seed um, research. Um, we rented, we leased a field um, and hand sewed it with grain from the Vavilov Institute in Russia and um, in St. Petersburg in Russia. This is a, which is a, a very um, large um, plant seed database and um, not far from this field um, there were set up test fields in the Second World War with stone grain from the same institute. So you, now you see this, um, these are all plants and there is an historian, historian picture. Um, this project we did with a Russian artist Sergei Kishenko in cooperation with Art in Open Space in Styria, but also with the incorporation with the Vavilov Institute and with the BOKU, which is the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. And it was also shown on the fifth Moscow Biennial. There is an image of one of these plans. There is a lot information about this project because it was a three years project. Um, you can find it on our website, www.resanita.at. So there's another project um, we did with a research facility, the Oak Observatory Haute Provence, um, which studies the effects in climate change on oaks. Um, and we, in this project, um, we brought an entire tree with all its 80,926 leaves to an um, exhibition room. So we picked all the leaves, counted them, pressed them, and um, uh, processed them as um, herbarium records between sheets of paper. And um, each leaf was photographed individually and um, with all these photographs, we made an overlay. And this overlay was also, so 80,926 pictures in this picture. This overlay was also presented alongside the whole tree in the exhibition, Fleeting Territory in Vienna, in the Kunstraum Niederösterreich. Um, there's another project, it is, we did it for the Kunsthaus Vienna Museum Hundertwasser, which focuses on nature and ecology. Um, this is our, um, I call it, research camp on the roof of the building. Um, we, recorded, we recorded all the plants, mosses, lichens, from the whole roof and from the side walls of the building with botanists. Um, for an exhibition there, and I, here you can see some of the plants, and we um, made this photograph with one sample of each variety, and um, titled this work 
climate bouquet. There is um, a project, um, or this is a, yeah, a project um, for an exhibition, um, Plans and Politics in the Kunsthalle Exnergasse in Vienna. And we looked for the political symbolism of plans. So plans are a symbol for political groups, for clubs, for organizations, but they are also a namesake for revolutions or political upheavals or actions. So now um, I, I will show my own work, my own project, and um, I, I work in the same um, spectrum like Resanita, that means um, on the interdisciplinary field of nature with scientists, biologists, botanists. Um, this project um, I did for Art in Open Space, uh, Styria, and an art event, um, which is um, called Wasser Biennale, Jogus Garden. And um, in this project, I followed a river for 114 kilometers. That means in the upper reaches um, where the river is a small stream with shallow water, I went into the river bend, uh, into the river bed <laughs> with waterproof shoes. Uh, yeah, with waterproof, with waterproof boots. And in the lower reach, um, there you can see me taking water samples. Um, and the lower regions, um, in the lower reaches, I kayak, I kayaked. Um, the river is um, interrupted with 30 um, hydroelectric power stations and dams, and its course is severely um, disturbed. So, this picture shows me kayaking. Um, so the project dealt with um, history um, because rivers have been transport, important transport routes in former times, but also with ecology, biology. Um, we will see it in the next pictures. So this, Axela, this video. Oh, okay. I had to put out the kayak a lot of times because of the dams. Um, how I get back now? Ah, here, okay. So, um, for this project, um, the trip um, lasted two weeks, but I worked on this project also for two years because, um, because um, I took water samples. Um, I compared stones from the upper reaches with the sand from the lower reaches. Um, I was looking to the source with the hydrologist. Um, I recorded the vegetation of the river banks with a botanist. And um, here you can see the vegetation because it, it has changed with all these dams and with um, with the time. So here is a sheet of paper um, recording plans. Um, I can't find it. Okay. So um, it is very. <laughs> can you see it, Alison? Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, okay. Here we go. I know okay. it's a very faint image because of this technique that you're using to preserve the plant, right? You, um, what did you ask me? You cannot see this image? I can see a light impression of the image. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just told you before, um, I worked with the botanist and um, from some samples, uh, I took some samples of the plants and um, pressed and dried them and made um, herbarium records, as I often do. And um, I coated these dried plants with um, 
uh, transparent um, juice extract and printed them on paper. That means um, at first you can see just um, an invis there's just an invisible imprint on the paper. And to make it visible, I heat it with a candle from the, with the flame with the flame of a candle from the back side. Um, and then on the front appears this brownish filigree drawing. Um, so these are the back sides. There you can see the black traces of the soot of the candle. And um, for the I exhibited this project and for the exhibition I used the back sides. Um, and I called this plant up archive. I had, I think I had about 20 plans. I called it um, cryptography in reference of this method of secret writing, like we did as children with the lemon juice, but also because it looks a little like um, characters. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there are some images. And can you talk a little bit about the history of how this technique was developed? Um, I, um, I um, developed this technique for me when I was staying in the Mexican rainforest. Um, I, I collected plants there and I was thinking about um, how I can, um, how I can, um, uh, what describe plants? No, how I can um, like make yeah make some kind of record and how I can make plant records um, without photographing, mm -hmm. nor to take them with me because if you stay in Mexico or somewhere else, it is forbidden to take plants um, across the borders and. Um, there was, and uh, I had some lemon juice, and then I developed this um, technique or, yes. So there are some more images. And there's always the, the, brown, uh, the brown drawing on the back side and on the front side. So, and this is the exhibition, uh, so this is a, a picture from the exhibition itself. So there I had the boat and this plant um, switches on the walls. Um, ah, okay, so I will come to the next project. Um, when I went down the river and recorded plants, um, a river is something like a line. And there is a, and to record, Record and along a line is a method of biology. It is called line transect. So, uh -huh. line transect um, is also the title of this project. I will show you now. Um, it is um, in the three, I did it in the three border country, uh, in the three border corner of the countries Austria. Hungary and Slovenia. That's also the area where I grew up. And um, in this um, in this area, the uh, the border was guarded up very strictly um, until the 80s. So that means um, between the Hungarian and the Slovenian border, there was a fence, mm -hmm. um, the so-called Iron Curtain. And um, I have to say, um, these, these neighboring uh, areas of the countries are very, very, very poor. So the result that resulted um, in a high level of biodiversity. So this whole area is now nature, under nature protection. So um, I- And when uh, you were up here, um, I remember we were talking about in your in your childhood, even though the southern border was only like what you said like ten or twenty kilometers from where you grew up, you didn't cross it until 
they it, it, it was um people didn't cross it because the hungarian border you couldn't cross you know because there was the fence and and there were also um people were not used to it or there was nothing on the other side to go there you understand so for the it was like um like on the moon or something yeah you, you just have a sense like if you were a kid playing in the forest like you had a sense of where you could go and then there was the area where nobody goes yeah these countries behind um they didn't exist uh, exist in in a way mm -hmm. do you understand me so i didn't live directly at the border there have been some about 15 kilometers to the slovenian border and i think it is about 30 kilometers to the hungarian border but um they were not in our mind the other countries it's i, I cannot better describe it now um i think i understand yeah um so um because of this um of these strong border lines you you understand me Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, I installed a wildlife camera on the former strip of the Iron Curtain to watch border crossings by animals. So this camera stayed there for two years and uh, I'll show you some images. For example, this video. So the wild pig used uses the border uh, the boundary stone as back scratcher um, okay so um looking to the vegetation and recording the vegetation there um i found this plant and um this plant um, which um, changed his nationality um several times by border shifts during the war mm -hmm. and also by natural spreading so it was um alternately um described um as slovenian or hungarian occurrence by botanists um, I showed it here, here you, that's a, a, a picture from an exhibition. And um, what I also found that was that were these objects in a small Hungarian museum close to the border. And um, so I found them in the museum into the original. This is um, my recreation. And um, it, they, it's, it's a kind of shoes and um, they were used for illegal border crossing because um, at the, um, between Slovenia and former Yugoslavia, there was no fence. There was a, a, all this hair road um, field along the border. So, um, um, with these shoes, it was possible to to cross this field without leaving any human traces. I, um, yes. The last time that you told me about this work, I just can't stop thinking about these shoes. Um, yes, there's something yeah, they're so poignant and um, like very beautiful and sad to think about. Um, and I, your, so much of your work is about history and politics and border crossing being caught up in the you know, natural life. And um, often, you know, kind of comparing humans to animals is a way that um, political groups can dehumanize other groups of people, you know, to kind of project this, well, we don't have to give this group the same rights as others because they're more similar to an animal, right? But in this case, the illegal border crossers would assume the identity of a deer in order to 
regain freedom of movement. Um, and I, yeah, I just think that's really beautiful. Um, it's also interesting to do this, um, you, uh, because I found them after I watched this animal border, uh, these this animals crossing the border, and then I found these shoes, so it was, um, it, it, it is connected to this, completely to this work, so <laughs> but it was interesting because when I went to this small museum, it is very hidden, it, nobody knows this place. I was thinking that I will find there something um, connected to my work. So, and then I saw these shoes laying under a table and asked the guy there. And, and then he told me this story. So I used these shoes in a performance um, uh, in an art festival, Transborders. Um, it was uh, in, in uh, 2019, last year. And now I'm working with these shoes on a video um, for an exhibition with the subject landscape. It is an exhibition from our from country exterior. So, and um, when I walk with these shoes, um, um, when I walked with these shoes, I recognize that it is impossible to flee with them. Uh -huh. So that's also in, an interesting <laughs> thing, you know. So if somebody catches you, you cannot run away. Um, okay. And I think it also, to me, I think we're going to see in some of your other work, you know, you're often working out of a field station, out of a tent or a small building in the countryside and um, do you find there's like a sort of get almost like you as the artist get to live a little bit like, like these animals that are crossing the border there's a um, <laughs> yes the question was if uh, because that's an interesting point because when i went um in this river um I had um, long boots. They are until um, until the end of uh, yeah, very long boots like trousers, something like that. And with these boots, I could go um, a straight line. Um, that means I could go um, into the river and on the other side out, and then um, through some um, bushes, you know, and then. To the water and then out again. So when I walked with this boot, I was thinking I'm walking like an animal, you know. So it's interesting. Yeah. And this, I, it's the same. Uh, it's a little the same. It's um, it's interesting to walk through a landscape and must not stop, mm -hmm. like we do, you know, like humans do. Okay. <laughs> I, th I think I cannot better tra better explain it. I cannot explain it better. Um, okay, so um, um, to um, I do a lot of investigation of areas or landscape or nature um, by 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 documenting the process of animals and plants and or by the presence of animal and plants. Um, so this is um, an upcoming project I do for the Kunsthaus Graz. And this is a circle of mushrooms. And a mushroom circle is one single organism that means um, there's the mycelium, the, um, the invisible mycelium in the soil, um, but it's one living being. So this is it now just a small one, but I found a very huge one in the forest um, with a circumference. Do I, is this the right word? With a circumference 
from 55 meters. Um, and it is about um, 50 to 100 years old. So, and in fact, the, the largest um, living being is a mycelium, a mushroom mycelium. So, on the, the, the largest living being on earth is a mushroom, a huge right. mushroom mycelium. You're saying like bigger than a blue whale. So I was interested in this circle and started to measure it. Um, and these mushrooms, um, they live in symbiosis with um, the trees and um, they are responsible for the phosphorus supply for the trees. So there is current research um, if this um, property can be used as a fertilizer substitute for in agriculture. And the exhibition in Kunsthaus Graz, um, the subject is future and um, future research. So I, I started to, to, to measure this um, circle. That's the measuring tool I used at first. Video still, you can see me here um, measuring this this large um, circumfer circumference, um, and then I started um, now or now I'm um, working or processing on to create um, sketches in the right scale because um, I want to transfer this circle. Um, in its original size in the exhibition room, maybe by a drawing on the floor or something like this. There you see me working. And for this mushroom circle, I worked, I think, two weeks, not all the time, but um, two weeks I drove there and worked there for a few hours. <laughs> It's a very nice work. <laughs> so, it almost seems like it needs a name. Like it's this ancient being that you can you can almost put on a map. It's somewhere in between a landmark and a creature. Yeah, um, I we 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 spoke um, a week ago, and I said to you um, when I was working there, I was thinking about the big organism under the soil and nobody sees it. So um, I said two um, flat uh, blue veils. <laughs> um, I'm working with a, a, a scientist um, who, who knows how this mycelium looks like because mm -hmm. it would also be interesting um, yeah, to know exactly uh, is it is it a uh, one meter um, circle or how it is you know um, I, uh, um, I'm working with a, with a with the survivors office now in cooperation with the survivors office I want to so this is the place the circle is here mm -hmm. uh, I want to entry it in the official cadastral map with its exact location like this. So that's, that is the location, but there are some measuring, spot, measuring points around because here there's the Slovenian border and it will be possible to do, do, do entry it in the map with its really perfect position. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, so what, what I have else? So for the, for the, um, this summer for the 21 um, in Vienna, I made, I held some um, biodiversity walks. That means um, um, I recorded the whole wild vegetation with botanists in the surrounding of the museum and 
the museum tried to organize, after the lockdown, they tried to organize um, public event, public, uh, outdoor events. So um, we made, I made, I mapped all the wild plants um, with surround um, with the botanists and the public um, could participate in guided tours. So we looked what it is, what they are, what grows between the objects in the sculpture garden as well as in the cracks of the parking lot and as well as in the wider neighborhood. And, and what, what did people want to know about these plants? Um, people, uh, people are interested in spontaneous vegetation, um, urban people, um, because, um, oops, um, they are interested in plants and they are interested in how wild vegetation can come up somewhere. You see, this is a, a park. Uh -huh. And there are plants, they are planted by the city, but um, nature comes up everywhere. So it's interesting to look how nature finds their cracks. Yeah, I've had that experience in, in Brooklyn too, and in, in my own small garden at um, plants will kind of spontaneously start growing and I'll kind of let it get big enough so that I can identify it. Um, and yeah. about, like birds or other animals, like bringing it there. Um, there's also an installation from Louis Weinberger, The Wild Cage. Mm -hmm. You can see it here. Do you see the cursor of my... Yes, I can see. Ah, okay. Um, so um, uh, he allowed uh, in this in this um, cage, it is uh, wild plants come up, um, and you cannot cut them. So it was also a point of recording to look what's growing now inside there. Yeah. Um, for for the Belvedere 21, I also watched. Um, Moths with the doctorist um, right next to the museum. It, uh, the, this observation was also organized as a public event. Um, the, the insects, the nocturnal insects, are attracted by this um, illuminated net, a kind of light sculpture, and um, insects and moths are important bio indicators for the natural condition of a habitat. So we spent there one night with this um, installation. And I'm, I also worked um, with an artist friend of mine, with Alfred Lenz. Um, I worked on a moss concert in his recording studio. So there you, oops, there you can see a very small sequence. So <laughs> that means we um, we attracted them outside, and they are so um, they stick to this net, and they are so attracted by the light that we could bring this um, light tower inside the recording studio, and they sat there while he was playing the concert. Wow, and could. Did he record like the sound of their wings as they were flying or or they were the audience for the concert? They were in the audience for the concert. Um, they, they moved just a little and um, we cleared up before with the lepidopterist if um, this noise makes no So we cleared this um, before. Mm -hmm. Um, and I work, I'm working also on um, temporarily moth sculptures, like this one I did in the summer. And I also 
created this moss flag for my an illuminated flag and if the wind is not um, going too much if then they will sit on this flag um, for my field station and the field station um, is um, a tiny a very tiny um, working space um, somewhere um, an outdoor working space mm -hmm. um, And um, here you can see a field station in the um, in front of us, nearby the area of the of the Oak Observatory. Um, it is a, just a, a and the scientists they put their tools inside. Sometimes there are some measuring instruments there, and they use it to observe. So. Um, my artwork um, takes place mainly in the outdoor or in the field. So, and I'm also working with a lot with scientists. So, it was fairly obvious to build a field station um, for um, as a place um, where I can process material directly on site. I can observe. I can work with artists. Um, I can use it as a place for contact or also to give some mini presentations there. So um, I list, I list um, um, a piece of land, a plot of land. This, uh, I lease it for two years. And um, last week, I told you, um, we built there this small, tiny working space or research station or field station. And um, this field station will stay there for two years. It, it really reminds me of, um visiting Marfa, Texas uh, to go to the Chinati Foundation where they have the Donald Judd sculptures in the landscape. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, that work. He makes kind of big industrial a few. <laughs> um, but I, in, um, in Marfa, Texas, they have a permanent installation of Donald Judd's um, work outdoors, and you can go and visit it with a tour guide. But I remember when I visited, um, I thought, well, this would be great if they would allow people to sort of occupy these structures. And so I love that that's, you know, you've built like a, a sculpture that you can occupy and use. But if um, um, it is in 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 reality, it is no in real. It's no sculpture because on the other side, there are two um, parts like this, and you can open them. And if you if we look back to this field station, so it's really the same, just um, more um, more straight. They have also the same tours, and um, it is very it is very small. It is it is nearly the same size. So this field station was my, the dream of my field station. <laughs> and when you see the 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 area, it is a little a little similar than than the one in France. So I tried. Is this? Field station close to where you live now? Um, it is. It is close uh, to where I live now. I live in Graz, actually in Graz, and this is at the Slovenian border. So these hills are in Slovenia, and um, these trees. There is a small, very very small river, um, and this is the border to Slovenia, and it is one of the oldest European borders at all. So, and it's it's the it's the place where I did most of my artwork 
of the last two years. So, because it's interesting of history, of this strong political history and of this nature, um, of this um, huge biodiversity. Mm -hmm. um, yes. It's interesting to see this just little stripe of, of ecology that's not been altered by humans. Like, and then, then on either side, it looks like farmland. Um, this is farmland and this, um, the area I leased um, was a former apple, um, um, how do you say? Orchard? Apple plantage, we say plantage. Yeah, and we would say apple orchard. Ah, uh, okay. And um, they cut it the trees because the, um, this is no business anymore. Mm -hmm. And the stripes in the grass, there have been the rows with the apple trees. So it's an interesting, um, and beside there, there's very strong protected nature. Um, and then there were these apple or or orchids. Um, from the 70s, from the 80s. Um, so it's also an interesting area which is in, in, um, in an upheaval. Did I use the right word now? Yeah. In a kind of change, you know? So because this far, uh, hmm, this kind of business, you know, it's, it's gone. Right. And I mean, I know, I know some artists here. Um, I'm thinking of uh, Brett Alton Bloom, um, who works in the American Midwest, um, who are involved in the restoration of land. So taking something that had been used as farmland and then converting it back into um, what the ecology would have been before human intervention. Is that something that you're interested in? Yes, I'm also interested in this topic because here um, it will be interesting in, the next, interesting in the next two years how vegetation will change, you know, and um, I think here you can see there is a small, uh, there are some apple trees um, left over. Um, I think at all it's more interesting to be than to be somewhere else on a hill with um you know with no human um traces so it yeah. because we have these um nature protected areas besides so it's also a kind of we can I can compare vegetation or yes it seems like you're, so you, at the beginning of this lecture, you were showing some of your earlier collaborative work. And it seems like when you were working with your partner in that, it, you were, it was more involved in, in agriculture and kind of human projects of changing nature. And it seems like now your personal interest leans more towards what nature does when it's allowed to you know be wild and do what it wants to do um maybe you are right yes <laughs> we see it from outside you know so um i think i didn't think about that before but it can be yes because that i'm interested in at least more in the wild nature and how wild nature comes to several places. Um, I told you that for my residency in New York, I hopefully in 2022, um, I want to set up um, something like a small camp or a very tiny building somewhere in the open space. There is just one picture more. Um, my camp in the rainforest. Um, uh, yeah, to set up a small um, camp or something to, to make um, nature observing and research, biodiversity research. I think that's something that 
New Yorkers are really hungry for and that they'll be super curious about. And um, I'm excited for you to do it. 2022. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I showed you my, um, my work and um, I'm at the end of my presentation. Great, well, um, I guess what, what I, one thing I wanna ask you about is if you could talk a little bit more about how you collaborate with different scientists and um, how, if there are people that you sort of are long-term scientific collaborators or if it's very project specific and you seek out an expert in a, in a specific place or field, depending on what you're doing. Um, mostly they are long time cooperators or some of them I cooperate in several projects and I have something like, <laughs> meanwhile, I have something like a scientist pool, you know, <laughs> for everything, for every topic, I have somebody. And if I need something, an information for mushrooms, I call one. And if I need uh, somebody for some plants, I, I have one. So, um, and they are also, I think they are also happy to, to work with artists because, um, and, and um, they like it because somebody takes this work very serious, you know, and is interested in the things they know. So it is, it is really um, very interesting to work with people and and yes i said they like it so how if I do a scientist for example for fossils or whatever and say i'm an artist and i want to know this or that so they are always very happy you know to share their their knowledge and um do you think and some of these long-term collaborators of yours do you think that they also learn something about art or um, or maybe even come to think of themselves as being you know ex using their work to do a, like a creative expression um, sometimes they are um, they're wandering at first you know um, mm -hmm. but um, Uh, what I want to say, how can I say it? Um, they come, they, 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 when they see the results and come to exhibitions, so it's interesting for them how do, how, how transfer, you know, this, um, these things into a, an art piece or bring it to, because you, this art, you can bring these topics to another, um, Publicum to another public. And yeah, because it's also, as with art workers, I think a lot of people who work in the sciences, there is a public role involved of educating the public, of, you know, convincing people that what they're doing is important and something that people should pay attention to. And maybe through your projects, like they're finding that they're able to connect with the public in a new way. And it's interesting to connect, um, uh, connect all the different topics, you know, politics with ecology and plants with borders and mushrooms with history and, you know, so it's a really huge um, pool or it's a, a huge field for, for to work with. Right. Yeah, I think I, I was telling you that um, yeah, I come from a background in like higher education in the arts and, and I've seen 
definitely over the last maybe five years, a trend towards um, artists really wanting to learn how to work with ecology and um, under, you know, climate change is kind of one of the most pressing issues that faces us as a global community. And so of course artists want to make something about that. Um, and I think that you having um, so many years of experience collaborating with scientists and developing these techniques to kind of make connections in between um, these different kind of areas of knowledge, like um, you and your you and your network are such a huge resource um, to other people. Um, you said you you come from. Okay, um, I just wanted um, to tell. Also, I grew up there, and. Um, um, when I was a children, I spent the whole time in the forests and at the rivers. Yeah. Um, when I was a child, we also had to work a lot on, you know, on, on a small farm. So my father made barrels. Um, he worked with oak tree. We had, um, we had an um, working working room um, where he made, you know, a barrel um, for wine. Mm -hmm. And then we had a small farm and we had to work a lot and we were a lot um, outside. And if I look to my artwork now, I can find all the things I did when I was a child. So it's also interesting, you know, the, somewhere in these projects you can find this, uh, um, when I was a child, I was playing always at the river, then I make the art project walking down the river. So that's also interesting for me now to see how these um, things come up now. Yeah, I love that you've been able to like make that into your, into your life's work. And I wanted to say there was no art background or nothing because I told you this area was very poor and there were. So how did you how did you find yourself in this art context? Um, at first, I uh, started to to study biology, um, and um, if you see this land. Uh, I went to school there and an art, um, an artist teacher said to me, I have to study arts, but it was, um, I could not um, imagine how to go to Vienna study arts, you know, but then I, at this time, but then I made an art school and now um, I can do all this Botanist, botany and um, in, in the artwork. So, um, I, so, and for that, that I don't know, I have the scientists. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for sharing your work with me and with, um, you know, the people that are watching this video right now and, um, you know, it seems like it seems like a long time, but also a very short time from now that, you know, 2022 20, will be here and you're going to come to New York and do a residency at ISCP. So, you know, if there are people watching here in New York, I encourage you to keep up with Anita's work and, um, you know, this is it seems like you often invite the public to take part in what you're doing. So I hope when you're here in New York, there are opportunities for people here to um, both help you with what you're doing, but also learn from you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you so much.